Hello, my name is Chris Roberts. I want to welcome everyone to our special um, show on um, veterans of Cheshire County. We're here to take an oral history of a lot of our veterans, World War II, um, Korean War, and early Vietnam War veterans, members of Cheshire County um, who went into the service. Many made the choice of going to the service. Some were drafted, but they all made an impact, and it all changed their life. This is in honor of Veterans Day, and we will have two episodes, one to run all this week and one to run um, next week. So I hope everyone enjoys this, how people use this to reflect back and look at the contributions these men and women um, have contributed to our great country. And so our first guest will be... Anne Panetta. But I, 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 I was in Massachusetts at the time. I That's all right. So. <laughs> You're here now. <laughs> I'm up here now. We retired up here, my husband and I. He was in the Navy. So we, we, we used to have words over that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so you, what branch of the service were you in? I, I, was, a, I, I was a Marine. In, in, uh, my uh, rank was corporal. I, I, that's as far as I went. And, uh, it, when did uh, you join the Marine Corps? Uh, 1942. And uh, I, was, I was there just short of three years. I was, uh, I was glad to come home. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, since women were never drafted, no. what, what made you make up your mind that you want to become a Marine? I, uh, I used to look at all those posters. Uncle Sam wants you. <laughs> <laughs> Remember those posters? And so I, I said, well, as a lock, my, my girlfriend and I were, were going to join. Well, she backed out. <laughs> I went through all that, all that physical and, and mental and everything else. And uh, so she said, oh, no, I, I, I guess I'm not going to bother. So I, 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 was there, I was there. So uh, it was uh, an experience. Yeah, because most women go after the Marines because they look co pretty cool and pretty sharp and they dress blues. <laughs> most don't join the Marine Corps to get near Marines. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Marines and ego went together. <laughs> uh, we don't have ego. <laughs> <clears throat> and um, I think one of the strange people, one of the things that most people don't understand, Marines, when um, the Commandant was asked, because all the other services, the Army, the Waves, the wax all those, and I was, in Marine Corps history, it's like, what are we going to call women Marines? What are we going to call women Marines? We've got to come up with some name. And he goes, Don it, a Marine's a Marine, yeah. and we'll call them Marines. A woman a Marine, yes, that was it. So uh, it, it, there was no other, no other nomenclature. No, no, culture. a Marine's a Marine. So where, where were you stationed in the United States? Uh, I was permanent personnel at Camp Lejeune. And uh, I never did get to Camp Pendleton as I wanted to, but uh, you wanted to hang out with I, the Hollywood I worked, guys. I worked in the uh, quartermaster office, and uh, we, I relieved a, a Marine for active duty. So <clears> that's that was the the reason for the women Marines, so that the, the men could go to the uh, do the do the duty overseas. Because the Marine uh, women Marines never went overseas. We went as far as Pearl Harbor. And that was that was. The extent of travel. Can I remember those posters? Join Marine Corps, send a man overseas, send a Marine overseas. Yes. I don't know if they always liked it, but <laughs> <clears throat> so at Camp Lejeune, you spent about three years at Camp Lejeune, quartermaster. So that's basically supply. Supply. And so uh, you, you saw a lot of a lot was, of people yeah, going through. Yeah, it was a, it was a beautiful camp, but it was set in in the in the wilderness <laughs> of North Carolina. <laughs> Uh, to, uh, we, we used to have a 48-hour pass, and we'd go up to Raleigh. That was uh, uh, Liberty Town. That's the, the <laughs> capital of North Carolina. So uh, it was, uh, as I said, an experience. I didn't think I'd be, uh, a after a few months, I didn't think I'd be homesick, but I, I, I really was. I got over that, but uh, <laughs> that was... Uh, but in, um, <clears throat> I spent plenty of time in Camp Lejeune. It can be quite brutally hot and humid in yeah. the summer. Yeah. You've got nice beaches, but it's quite different than Massachusetts. Yeah. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But it was, it was a nice camp. I remember that uh, 
Olympic-sized pool that uh, whenever I, whenever I could, I I, uh, I took advantage of uh, of swimming because I love to swim. So uh, it was uh, it was really a very nice camp. Did you ever get to visit some of the great cities like Charleston or Savannah, or you were just stuck at Camp Virginia? Um, well, it was mostly uh, uh, Raleigh. Um, uh, there wasn't much. There really wasn't much in North Carolina. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, Camp Lejeune is still big, and it still isn't much in North Carolina. No. <laughs> so I want to thank you for coming, thank and you. I enjoy your service. Yes. I thank your service. Thank and you. And I, I thank you for standing up and making a choice. Oh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Simplify. Simplify. Okay. I'm getting here with um, the second guest of the day, but before we introduce the second guest of the day. I'll do something I'm not supposed to do. Our last guest, the female Marine Corporal, pretty spry and pretty um, attractive looking for someone at 88 years old. So she should be graduating. We all should look as well as she does at 88. Okay, how's it going? Good, I'm Don Guyette, USN. I went in in 47 <clears throat> and got out in 51. Spent my four years on a destroyer. Bounced around on the open sea. <laughs> uh, I don't have much to contribute other than that. My first trip overseas, my ship split a seam, and we went in the dry dock in Gibraltar with an Italian tug. <laughs> they went one way and we went another. <laughs> and we all ran because that tightened up the hawsers. But uh, we survived. So when you, when you went in the, um, the Navy, where'd you go to boot camp? Did you go to Great Lakes? I certainly did, yeah. I was in the um, Sea Cadets. I went there for, for two weeks. That place really stunk in the morning. Oh, God, I tell you. <laughs> I went in the wintertime, and you could throw a cat through those barracks, <laughs> you know. <laughs> With just studs in the walls. No insulation, no wallboard or nothing. We were right on the lake. Get some brutal north oh, winds. Oh, God, it was terrible. Anyways, we survived, made us tougher. So you said you spent your time on a destroyer. What was your job on a destroyer? Well, I started out as a deckhand, and then I progressed to be a third-class gunner's mate. So you went from being a swabby to one of the more important, one of the more higher-ranking right. priority. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, we had several incidents. Uh, yeah, that's about the size of it, I guess. So you, you spent time in Gibraltar in Spain. So any other um, ports oh, of call did, in Europe? We did the uh, Mediterranean, four, four trips to the Mediterranean. So we went to every place that was available, even places that weren't on the map. We had to uh, go out and lead sink them to, to check the depth. The, the sounding. Sounding, yeah, that's it. So we had a lot of Cinderella liberties. <laughs> I went to, um, I did my med cruise, and I was in Naples, and that was in 79. But Naples is one of the dirtiest cities I've seen. I would see kids jumping into the water, swimming, and they would have to come up like with this because they had all raw sewage and everything yeah. in, the, in the city, out in that water. Not like they did on the travel brooches. What year would that be? 79. Uh -huh. So it must have been pretty nasty. And, yeah, well, we used to do it Mediterranean more. We used to back in, and the guys would, the firemen would go across, check the lines on the beach, come back with a bucket full of wine bottles. <laughs> the old vino, huh? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. So I want to thank you. I want to thank you for your contribution to our country. Thank and you. And it doesn't matter, four years, 20 years, 30 years. You contributed. You stood up. I did. Yeah. Okay. okay. No. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. You're going to tell the audience your name? Ray Johnson. Previously, uh, Sergeant Johnson. And uh, I so went in the Corps in December of 42, December 7th, because December the 7th and 41, that's when Pearl... Pearl Harbor was hit, and uh, I knew that I wanted to get 
into active duty, and I didn't want to wait for the draft. So I went down and I volunteered down at Church Street. A Brooklyn boy was accepted. And from there, I went on. The first I served in the, uh, in the Pacific with the uh, <coughs> 3rd Marine Air Wing. And I was on the ground crew. <coughs> and uh, there I was in chemical warfare, and I used to instruct it to the enlisted and also officers. And uh, second time, when I just, we got married 10 days before, and I got called back on uh, active duty for the Korean action. And uh, at that time, I, I changed my way. I didn't realize it was going to happen. And they put me in line company. And uh, from there, I became a platoon sergeant. And uh, I opened it up and did a job and uh, went to school and <clears throat> became what they call CBR man, chemical, biological, radiological safety. Also instructed, enlisted in offices in that. And it's it in a nutshell. The, um, <clears throat> I don't know, a lot of people realize that after World War II and right before Korean, yeah. it became, the Marine Corps almost passed out of existence. Yeah. It was <clears throat> individuals like you, <clears throat> excuse me, Ted Williams and some of the other ones who came back yeah. and did such a great job during the Korean conflict time that proved to America we need a Marine Corps. Yeah, but it became, it became very, very <coughs> interesting <clears throat> out in California. I was on a naval base going to school there, and we used to fall out, and uh, it would be early in the morning. Of course, uh, it's wet because the, chem the chemistry there was with the uh, rain coming in and everything else, and we used to fall out on a grinder, a blacktop. On one side of the grinder was the naval base, and there they had the seamen that were in training, and the Corps was on the other side. Chow Hall was down the far end. And uh, we used to fall out, and <coughs> we did uh, to the Winds March you're familiar with. Yeah. So uh, as you know, it's right flank goes to the right, <laughs> left flank goes to the left, and one on the right goes forward and the other goes back. And then the silent commands. And you went, somebody went, and with this, everything formed together, and you walked off to Chow. Well, what happened was that one of the seamen came over. And they said, uh, one of our seamen over here <coughs> is very impressed on how you handle and what you do with your to the winds march. Could he be shown what to do? So one of the other fellows says, yeah. So this fellow came across the grinder and uh, talking, talking to him, I looked at him sideways. I said, you know, I've never been to California before, but I said, I know you. <laughs> and it turned out that uh, my name is Hank. And I said, oh, Hank. I says, what is your given name? He says, Henry. He says, I'm Henry Fonda. <laughs> oh, wow. And <clears throat> found out that he's a very nice person. I have met other people while I was overseas also, but I won't bring that up now. But, but, the, but I don't think, um, when people talk about the military now, yeah. it's quite different than World War II. When you had people like Henry Fonda, Harold Flynn, Jimmy Stewart, or Joe DiMaggio, Yep. They stood up. They didn't wait to get drafted. Mm -hmm. They stood up and says, this is what we have to do for our country. This is the right thing to do. They stood up to be counted. They stood up to be counted. And we all know, well, I'm not that, but if we reflect back, you know in the draft and some of the other ones, if you had the right family name or you knew the right person, there was always a way for you to get oh. 4F or find a reason oh. not to be drafted. Or, they, or they'd skip off and go over to Canada to try and get so, away from it. But in World War II, no, I never went that way. But in World War II, a lot of people who didn't have to 
yeah. stood up to be counted and they gave up some of the most productive times uh, of their life because they thought it wasn't yeah. a beneficial of the company, yeah. country. True. Yeah. And yeah, so, so I want to, one other part is when you talked about <clears throat> the Marine Corps yeah. and you said there's something that you put off real quick. When you get recalled for a career, which a lot of Marines did, yep. you had to change your wedding and you had to change that. Yes, that's right. <clears throat> what did you it was very wipe, upsetting for my wife. <laughs> wipe the bit. <laughs> but you had to do that to be able to, to get, like you said, to get oh, the guests there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And so your wife is, wife is forgiving you, right? Oh, yes, she has. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> well, thank you, Sergeant, and good luck, and have a good Veterans Day. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> okay, I'm back with my next guest. Yep. Carlton Reed. Carlton I, Reed. I'm that's Reed. Ira Yadine. Yeah. Everybody spells it wrong. <laughs> okay, yeah. what branch of the service were you in? Army. Army, see. Went in 1946, uh, September 46, after high school and took basic training at Fort Bragg in artillery. Went over in the occupation of Japan, got there at the end of December, and uh, was uh, in uh, Fukuoka, Camp Kakura. And uh, then uh, one day we were out there polishing howitzers, and the first sergeant came out and said, if you Test scores are over 100, and you'd like to transfer to the medics. Raise your hand. You know, <laughs> well, gee, it'd be much better in the medics and polishing howitzers out here in the rain. And uh, so, I volunteered. And a couple of weeks later, I found out I was a medic. So I became a company clerk of a medical company, and uh, became a sergeant. And uh, then I got out and. I think it was July of 48, came home 1950, I got married, and uh, May of 50, and June 25th of 50, the Korean War broke out. So we were with another couple, and he had just gotten out of the service. And, uh, we said, well, they won't call us, we're in an <laughs> inactive reserve. Well, they fooled us, they called us. He was on his honeymoon when he was <laughs> ordered to report for a physical. And they, you know, we reported to Manchester for physicals. And then uh, they gave us 30 days to clean up our affairs and went to Fort Dix. And then most of the fellows came up to Fort Devon. There were about three or four of us that went to 90 Church Street, Manhattan. <laughs> That's where I spent the, a year of the Korean War, <laughs> 90 Church Street, Manhattan. But as somebody told me once, everybody has a job to do. Everybody has a job to do. <laughs> and so, and uh, so it was, um, and there I became a staff sergeant after a while, so that's, and I was discharged, but I didn't join the inactive reserve again. <laughs> 19, that was 1951, I got done again. But there was an awful lot of people especially in the army in 46, 47, who couldn't wait to go to Japan for the occupation because they said, this is really nice duty. We have nothing to worry about. Not back in those <laughs> days it wasn't because uh, when we were in uh, Kokura, where the hospital was, there was two main drags, one east and west and one north and south in the city. And that was all we were allowed on. Yeah, and the MPs watched us pretty closely. So. <laughs> they, uh, but you know, there's always a few that are able to get around. Oh yeah, and well, they had a couple of cabarets yeah. that we could go to at night and drink Japanese beer and dance with Japanese girls. And uh, Japanese women, uh, I guess most of the people at that time thought, "You are my sunshine" was the national anthem. <laughs> <laughs> they always, <coughs> they always played it every night two or three times. <laughs> and. <coughs> So how many total years did you spend on active duty? On active duty, it was uh, about three, a little, a little over three, I guess. And I had, for longevity purposes, about six, and it was uh, uh, inactive duty. So if you had to do it all over again, would you do it? Oh, sure. Yep, absolutely. <coughs> it was 
I, I enjoyed the service. It was a good, it was a good change, because when you're overseas at 18, 19 years old, you say, geez, I'm 10,000 miles away from home. Will I ever get back? <laughs> you know, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I figured you're pretty safe in the occupation. So, because yeah. after seven o'clock at night, you always had a buddy system anyway. You had to be. So you grew up in New Hampshire. I grew up in Keene. In Keene. Born in Concord and grew up in Keene. Yeah. And what was it? What was it like to go to um, Fort Bragg for basic and see people from all around the country? Wow. Well, I, I think the biggest shock was the uh, racism, which we never ran into in Keene, obviously. And I went to Fort Bragg, and all of a sudden there's uh, colored writing rooms and white writing rooms and that type of thing, which, you know. I had never encountered, and I, it was kind of a <laughs> culture shock, I guess. <laughs> and, uh, but it was, um, and uh, it was. I'd, I'd, one day on on the ship coming back from we had gone from uh, Yokohama over to Pusan, Korea, to pick up troops, and they have to anchor out yep. there because the big ships tides. Can't, the very narrow, uh, shallow port, and. Uh, I was walking along the deck, and all of a sudden I was up in the air like that, you know, and I turned around, <laughs> a big fellow about, about the size of, uh, about, probably about six, four or five, and he was carrying me around like I was a, <laughs> a toy. Of course, at that time I only weighed about 135 pounds anyway, but it was, um, it was, it was fun. I, I, en I enjoyed the service, and I, w you know, if I had to do it again, I would. Maybe I'd go in a different branch. I don't know. The Marine Corps is always looking for good men. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not at 82, though. <laughs> no, not at 82. But you know what? You're looking good at 82. Yeah. You're looking I, really I, good at 82. I feel good at me. Like yeah. I tell everybody, between the, my cardiologist and my uh, primary physician and my wife, they're taking good care of me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to thank you. We thank you. Yep, thank you. Appreciate you. Yep. Okay, I'm here with my next guest, and George Michaelitis. I'm not even going to try to pronounce that, George. <clears throat> but um, before we get into your past, the first time I met you is when I got um, retired and I was pretty messed up and I needed a bunch of rides to White River Junction. And I was driving for the DA. At you the were time. driving it for the DAV, mm -hmm. so <clears throat> I didn't have a license and all. It took me about three or four more years just to mm -hmm. be able to get physically fit to get my license back. So I want to say. Myself, in behalf of all the other veterans that you were able to give rides up there, thank you. It was our pleasure. <laughs> so, when did you join the, well, you were in the Army, right? I was in the Army, yeah. Well, I didn't join the Army, I was drafted. <laughs> and when I was drafted, I was in graduate school. I was uh, <clears throat> attending the University of Pennsylvania, the Wharton School. And uh, <clears throat> I had enrolled in the um, a logistic, uh, economics and logistics <laughs> program, transportation. And um, most of the class was made up of uh, military officers, uh, colonels, mm -hmm. captains, and so on. And um, so it was sort of interesting, um, you know, being in the class with people like that. And um, when I was, I had gotten drafted, but I had a deferment to finish up the studies. So. Um, a couple of them that I was friendly with, they said, you know, with, with this kind of um, education, you have to get into the Transportation Corps. So I said, well, how do you do that? He says, don't be stupid. <laughs> he said, just call your congressman. <laughs> so I did, and I ended up in the Transportation Corps. And because of the studies that I had made, they made an instructor out of me. So I, I taught at the Transportation School in, um, <clears throat> down in um, Fort Eustis, Virginia. And, uh, so I was with all these officers, and some of them were my classmates. And, well, but uh, we all know the military can't move without logistics. Well, that's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> nothing can move without logistics. Uh, <clears throat> but one of the interesting things, well, interesting, uh, it, was, it was mentioned earlier about the segregation and so on. Well, uh, President Truman had desegregated the services. Uh, yeah, 1948. And, uh, so, uh, and here, this was now 52. So we were training, um, you know, it was the, the services were desegregated. And um, it was interesting. I was, uh, most of the unit was half Southern whites and half Southern blacks and me. 
<laughs> <laughs> so it was, uh, it was rather strange. And then um, <clears throat> the first pass I had, I went into Newport News, Virginia, <clears throat> and um, I decided to go back to camp. So I get on the bus and I sit in the back. And the driver comes back and says, you can't sit there. I said, why? He says, because you're white. <laughs> and I said, are you crazy? And I'm in uniform now. So he just takes off. Next minute, two police come on. They arrest me. They said, you're under arrest. I said, good. <laughs> I said, you could take my place. And uh, to their credit, they call the MPs. And I was really in no mood to, I mean, I was really angry. <laughs> and uh, so the MPs calm me down. They take me off the bus and so on. And they get me back to camp because, you know, I, I was just, I wasn't used to this kind of uh, thing. So I got back to camp and uh, I was friendly with a lot of the black soldiers. And I'm, I could not understand how patriotic they were. You know, but they were. They were extremely patriotic and, and so on, and they calmed me down. <laughs> they, they calmed me down, but uh, it was a good experience, uh, the, the, the um, uh, teaching and so on, and uh, later on in my life I became an academic because of the experience I had in the service. And when you're talking about mm -hmm. <clears throat> feeling the, um, the, seg the mm -hmm. discrimination from... Yeah. I, growing up in, in New England, mm -hmm. and I remember in the 50s and the 60s, or especially in the 60s yeah. when I was a little kid, where going, oh, you can't sit in the back of the bus. Yeah. You got to sit. And I'm saying, yeah. I remember I was going on a school bus. Everyone is fighting to get in the back of the bus because only the cool kids <laughs> could be right. in the back of the bus. Exactly. And it was just different depending what part of the country you were in. Yeah. It's like, wait a minute. Why are you fighting not to be in the back of the <laughs> bus while we're fighting to be in the front back of the bus? <clears throat> And so yeah. times, you know, just based on um, location. Oh, yeah. yeah. And when you talk at Fort Eustis, I've been down to New Virginia Beach, yes, Newport, yeah, right. and yeah. Little Creek in Fort Eustis. Yeah. It's two totally different worlds yes. apart. Just because President Truman in 48 right. says mm -hmm. this is the way it's going to be, right. it didn't change the surrounding areas. Well, there were, some, so there were some bases where the generals put some towns off limits. Yes. And they, that, uh, you know, <coughs> money talks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that was... Uh, they, they Discriminate, they said, we keep the green. That's right. Yeah. And so yeah. did you ever go overseas or you just... No, I was, uh, I was, uh, you know, I was an instructor. Uh, and uh, everyone I, that, I, that I did my basic with, they all went to Europe. So I was <laughs> rather envious on that. <laughs> because it was, you know, it was peacetime at that point. What you're saying is the Oktoberfest in Germany is better than the Oktoberfest in Virginia Beach? That's a toss-up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I want to thank you for your time. And thank, thank you. For you. Your, and again, thank you for the rides that you gave right. all the veterans. Thank, thank you. you. I want to welcome our, our next guest um, all the way from Dublin, New Hampshire in this bad, crappy weather day. Yeah. Well, we had a lot of ice on the road and getting in and out of the car, pretty exciting. <laughs> Temperature of 30 degrees, 32 degrees. You were, um, what, what type of plane did you fly during World War II? F4, F4F, F, which was a small fighter. And let me tell you, I'm very happy to have my feet like this instead of having my knees up around my chin, you know. So did um, <clears throat> did you fly off carriers or? Yes, all all the way carrier based. Um, what were some of the carriers that you flew on? Well, I spent majority of my time on the Enterprise, which was the big carriage, which was the biggest, the most decorated ship in the Navy. And uh, I flew the F4F, which is not designed for somebody who's six foot two <laughs> inches tall. Because the cockpit is very small, and your legs are up like this, and 
they, you find that it's very difficult when you take off on a long flight. You have an extra gas tank down below, which will take you a hundred miles or so, and you always got rid of that the minute you thought you were going to be shot yeah. at by anybody. You wanted to get rid of that damn tank. To reduce the drag, give, give you some more speed? Excuse me? To, to reduce the drag and give you more speed in the dog Yeah, plate. yeah. <clears throat> and that was the only part of flying that I disliked because I had a couple of bad knees and uh, was known as the flying knee because of the fact that I was kind of gimpy. And uh, did you, um, when did you join, join the Navy? Well, I was in a, I try to figure out what day it was or what it was. It was nineteen forty-two or so, and I. Stayed in the Navy, in the Air Corps, until I finished blind flying uh, in 44. And I was scheduled to go out to Korea and fly night flying. And I decided that I wasn't interested in getting shot down in the middle of, of a flight by the Chinese who had some very good ammunition. And so I told the people who were looking me over to see if I was going to be available to go to go out to the same ship. And I told them that I was more interested in going back to my family of one child who's sitting over there. Well, she was. Yeah, Sally? She, she, she's there hiding behind the camera. She's kind of <laughs> behind the camera. Our first born child. And I really believed that flying at nighttime against the Chinese people who really had some interesting ways to shoot you down wasn't the best thing for me and my family of one child. Sally there taking my picture, which is nice. <laughs> She's a very good photographer. You're a very good subject. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know about that. We'll ask her opinion. I think it may be biased, but I think she thinks you're a very good subject. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Head seems to be a bit swollen, but this hat just doesn't fit me anymore. Do you know all those naval aviators? They're always got swollen heads. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, I learned to fly at the Harvard Aviation Camp in about 19... 39 or 40, I've forgotten which it was. And my brother had been at the business school at Harvard, and he called me up in Dublin and said, Peter, uh, 
We'd been flying, we, we'd taken flying lessons. Everything was on the government in those days. You just, just, <laughs> just as long as you could walk and talk. We and, can put you in a uniform. <laughs> wear a uniform. <clears throat> and uh, my brother called me and said, Peter, would you like to learn to fly? I said, sure I would. What did it cost me? He said, nothing. Just signed it. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, well, what do I have to do? He said, you got to show up. That's all I know. Pass a physical exam. And so we went to, he signed me up to the Harvard Aviation Camp. And I said, I didn't mind if I didn't go to Harvard. He said, hell no, you, I'm going, and you and I will be together there. So we went down to Otis Field, which is in the, on the Cape there. Otis, yeah. And uh, <coughs> learned, got our pilot's license there, which was pretty early in the game. And we, we simply learned to fly. So I was very interested in this, and I said to the people, where can I learn to do acrobatics? Well, you go up to Buffalo, New York, and you can get a guy who's been flying, teaching acrobatics. He said, how do you know anything about acrobatics? I said, well, I'm not stupid, but uh, I just knew that there was this ability to learn acrobatics because if somebody's chasing you and about to shoot you down you better get have some idea how to get out of the way <clears throat> so we went to my brother arranged all this too went to uh, buffalo new york and we found out that in Dublin, we were both going to be drafted if we didn't get 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 in the Army or Navy or the Air Corps. So that was that kind of woke you up in those that days. That was all that free flight training. You know? No, my old my father had been a major in the. War at uh, World War One, and his only comment to his sons was, <coughs> "Don't get in the infantry." And I thought Common it sounded sense. pretty sensible. When I told him about the diseases you got in the infantry, they start at your feet and go up to your head. Some people say it starts the other way. And I was in the infantry for a while too. <laughs> so. We learned with a fellow that had been doing acrobatics all his life, and his main claim to form of uh, he was flying. We were flying steersmen trainers, as were usually done. And he taught every. You sat in the front. And he had a mirror, he could see you, and then you could see him in the mirror. And he would say to you, uh, kid, he called me kid. And I said, well, hell, I was about his age, I was about 20. <laughs> and he, uh, he said, I'm going to show you some acrobatics that you'll uh, certainly enjoy. And so he said, how do you like flying upside down? I said, fine, nodded my head. I figure, what the hell, to go along with him, I might as well. So he said, well, don't touch the stick, which is what you fly with, or your arms and legs. And 
just, he said, I'll teach you everything I know about flying inverted. I said, gee, that's good. So I thought, well, I got a chance to learn what it's like to fly inverted. Well, if anybody's fly, flown inverted besides me, they know damn well it's upside down. And he would say, okay, kid, I'm gonna do pylon eights now. I'm gonna do it inverted. So he'd turn the plane upside down and we'd go around. Uh, what a, he'd make up a point to turn. A pylon eight, you do your thing come back and turn around another one over here. It's pretty exciting if you're holding on to the thing. You have a parachute, which you don't know anything about. You don't know who put it together for you, but it was old. And so you hold on to anything on the plane because being six foot two, and he was, he was about five foot five, and hell, he he was <coughs> down in a safety area, and he said, just don't touch the stick or anything like that. So you had to hold on to the side of the plane like this, and then you get all the air for coming in from there, and. He, he'd proceed to do his pylon eights upside down, which I don't think that people really would think would be anything but punishment. <laughs> and he wouldn't say anything to him because he'd make it worse <laughs> for you. <Nah. laughs> he was called the major. He was about my age. I was about 20 years old, and he was about 22 or something. And he'd been out learning to fly. And I'll just hold this for a little while, make it easier. Good. That's a good idea. <coughs> Thank you very much. No problem at all. My head grew yeah. <clears throat> my last birthday, which I was 92, incidentally. So Do you get a prize for the oldest guy that came here? Yeah, we might be able to come up with a prize with the oldest guy. 22 years old. <laughs> 92. <clears throat> and actually, I couldn't be a nicer guy. <laughs> right, Sally? <laughs> yeah. My daughter is giving me the signature, yes. And... Uh, I learned a hell of a lot from this guy that taught me some things I'd never teach if I were <laughs> teaching somebody about flying. And he loved to get that plane upside down because everything that you could do straight way up. For example, one of the things you learn if anybody here has taken lessons you learn to do a snap roll. Have you ever heard of that? Yeah, I spent a bunch of Did time. Did you fly? Three. Nope, I used to, <clears throat> I'll give you one. <clears throat> I went to El Toro. Yeah. And um, we're going in and I just report a board and it's um, physical time. And I'm going through and it's Navy nurse. She goes, oh, she's just yelling. And she goes, I see all these pilots coming out. They're screaming and they're kind of in pain and hurting. And she goes, are you a pilot? <clears throat> I go, uh, no, ma'am. I'm an engineer. I build the airfields. She says, good. She says, I was at the old club. I dated a pilot, and he dumped me. And so every time a pilot comes in, she just jabbed him with all the needles and all this other kind of stuff. And I'm going, nope. And I learned around that I'm not a pilot. I'm an engineer. I build them. Take it out on the next guy. He's a pilot. <laughs> well... <clears throat> this fellow told me, and he said, you know, I learned to fly, and I learned to do a lot of flirted, and I love it. I said, well, 
I like it too because, you know, when you look the guy in the mirror and you, he'd say, well, we'll do some inverted stuff, Peter. How's it sound? I said, it sounds good to me because I wanted to see what he was going to do. So, believe it or not, he taught me to do a snap roll. Have you ever heard of a snap yep. roll? Well, normal, you're sitting like this in the cockpit, and to do a snap roll, you slow the plane down a little bit and pull the stick back like so and kick your right rudder and the plane goes up in a, what would be a spin almost and turns around and that's an in, a snap roll and an inverted snap roll is something I haven't found anybody else done it except me is that you're flying inverted like so and instead of you pull the stick back suddenly and kick right rudder and the plane will go <laughs> right around and your stomach goes <laughs> into your face. <laughs> you don't know whether you're going to throw up or not, but it was it's really the most difficult thing you can do in the airplane because it can put you into a spin for one thing. You got to be prepared for anything that happens. But believe me, it was something that you knew how to do after that. I never wa went up and flew the plane and did an inverted snap roll because I didn't feel that it was necessary in my life. You, did, you didn't have G-suits back then like that? No, had. hell no. <laughs> you just had a... Vomit bag? A normal covering. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, that's how I became a fighter pilot. And I figured, by golly, I know what the hell's going on up there. At 10,000 feet, I know how to do things. And it was valuable information that you circulate in your mind. So. <clears throat> You spent time during World War II. You yeah. spent time on the Enterprise. Yeah. We couldn't have won the war in the Pacific without the Enterprise. And ships, That's right. And especially the squadrons on the, the Enterprise. Yeah. They yeah. did a tremendous job. You're 92 years old, yeah. and I see that you're only one of the 50% of the registered voters in New Hampshire that went to the polls last Tuesday. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Where was it? It stuck on me. <laughs> yeah, it says right here, I voted, New Hampshire voted. <laughs> but, <clears throat> but that's important. And I think a lot of people like you, the ones who spent time in Korea, Vietnam, World War II, yeah. they go and say, you know what? We're doing this. We're doing it so other people can have this right. Yeah. But we understand we go out and vote. A lot of the people who have got the right to vote as a result of what a lot of veterans have done yeah. and a lot of other ones have given their life for, take it for granted. Just don't go out and vote. Yeah, I don't know why not. I've been a uh, Republican since my father died, and he was a staunch Republican and voted for Al Smith. That's a long time ago. Al Smith, governor of New York, 1932, yeah. Yeah, 1932, you're right. <laughs> you know a hell of a lot more than I do. Well, I'm a Marine, we're supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> but well, um, <clears throat> I want to thank you for your time. Oh, well, you're welcome. I really enjoyed it. And I want well, to thank good. you for your service. Good. And um, you got that smile, well, 92, you. you got that smile. Thank you, too. You, you got a good grip, too. It's been my um, honor and privilege to sit down here and talk to with a number of our um, veterans. 
92-year-old Peter to 88-year-old Ann and some of our youngsters in the, in the 60s and the 70s. Um, they've had a lot to, to offer. It, you, it's just like being a little kid, just sitting here listening to the stories, the adventures that um, they have. And all their adventures and their stories have contributed to help contribute to the greatness uh, of this country. So as we go through Veterans Day week, Veterans Day and Veterans Day week, if you see a veteran, sit down and, and talk to them. Ask them what happened. Um, what did they um, experience? Especially if the veteran's your father or your grandfather. They have had a lot of s stories. They've been a lot of places. Sometimes they're way too modest and say, oh, nah, I didn't do anything. I was one of the lucky ones. I made it back. But you know what? They all stood up to be counted when it, meant, when it was time to be counted. So again, it's been my privilege to talk to these individuals, and I think you should take the advantage of these individuals and talk to as many of them as you can. I think they'll set you on the right track, and thank you.